This is Derek Walker here, and it's our Wednesday evening Bible study at Oxford Bible Church. And uh, praise God, we're in the book of Galatians, and it's all about our liberty in Christ and uh, about the gospel of Christ. We've been seeing in uh, Galatians 1 and 2, Paul has come out fighting for the gospel, the gospel of God that he preached, uh, because it had come under attack from false teachers, particularly from uh, legalism. And um, before we actually go into our passage today, uh, we're finishing off Galatians 2 and starting into Galatians 3 today, um, let me just set the scene by kind of ex explaining the kind of key concepts involved. You know, the fundamental human need, you know, we, we think of uh, all kinds of human needs in the world today, and, and they're all very important. But the, the fundamental human problem and human need is his relationship with God. And uh, the fundamental aspect is that uh, God is righteous. And also that man is a sinner. And he is separated from God. And the key question is, how can a man be right with God? How can that be made possible? And there are two essential religions in the world, and one says man can be made right with God by, by his good works, by his efforts, by trying to be a good person. And, and really the key word is, is trying. Uh, and, uh, but that is a false religion. In fact, that's a lie from the pit of hell. In fact, that's probably Satan's favorite lie, that you can be good enough to be right with God and to go to heaven. That is a... a damnable lie because it, it appeals to your pride and uh, and ultimately it will send you to hell the, uh, proverbs 14 it's 12 i think it says there is a way that seems right to a man but the end thereof is the ways of death and the other approach it, which is the truth of the gospel of grace which is that a man can only be made right with god by an by the grace of god by the free gift of god which has been made available to us through the death and resurrection of christ the perfect finished work of christ and only by faith in christ and what he has done for us in his death and resurrection then we can receive this grace and it is nothing of our own works and so we, this is what we would call salvation by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. And, and in particular, there are two um, issues, we, you might say. There are two areas to really understand the process uh, of being of righteousness, being right with God and living a life right, right before God that pleases God. There's two issues. One is the legal side of righteousness, and the other is the experiential side of righteousness. Okay, and they're, they're both important, but the legal aspect comes first. Now, Jesus dealt with the legal aspect of our righteousness, our right standing with God, when by, through the cross. Now, when he died as a sacrifice on the cross... In a sense, he did two things. First of all, he took our sin, the, the sin debt that we owed, and he paid the penalty for our sin. Praise God. And, and secondly, he offered up his perfect righteousness because he had lived a perfect, righteous life. And he offered up that righteousness on the cross to God so that it could be given to us. And basically, he created the legal foundation for our salvation so that when we accept his free gift that he offers to us of salvation, of himself, he is our salvation, um, God does two things on the legal level. Well, first of all, he puts us into Christ, into union with Christ, once we accept Christ. Then in Christ... He imputes his righteousness to us. Remember, on the cross, our sin was imputed 
to Christ. It was put to his account. And also, so when we accept that, our sins are remitted. They are released from us. Uh, and at the same time, Christ's positive righteousness is imputed to us. It's put to our account. This is a legal term. So at the moment that you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you trusted in him for your salvation. Christ's righteousness was imputed to you. That's the first important word. You possess the imputed righteousness of Christ. You are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that means your legal standing with God is established. Praise God on a firm foundation of Christ's imputed righteousness, independent from your works, your performance, all right, you stand before God, not on your own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. And you are fully accepted in Christ. You are um, under the favor and the blessing of God for, on a legal basis. Praise God. So that's the legal side. And when that was established when you your right christ's righteousness was imputed to you god then on the basis of that declared you forgiven and he declared you righteous and that's what we mean by justification all right to justify is a word used in the law courts when the judge would declare the man not guilty and justified in right standing and uh, that's the legal verdict of God. And it's the very opposite of the word condemnation. To be condemned is to be um, and declared guilty by the judge. To be justified is, to be, is the opposite. So when Romans 8.1, for instance, says, Therefore there is therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus, it's saying the same thing. You are justified. You stand on solid legal ground. Praise God. Now, that's the legal side, and that was accomplished at the cross, all right? It was accomplished at the cross, and you receive it for yourself at the moment of salvation. Praise God. But there's another side, too, which is the experiential side. You see, it's not as if, well, you're justified by faith, and now you can just carry on living a wicked life, you know, or a life set apart from God. No, no. Because you are now in Christ. And what God does on the experiential side is related to his resurrection. But notice the cross comes before the resurrection. Jesus had to die on the cross. Then he received the resurrection life and the power of God. Transforming him. Glorifying him. You see. So first of all, what has to be established is the legal side through the cross that you are in right standing with God. You have legal right standing with God. God relates to you as he would to Christ in that you, you stand before God in the righteousness of Christ. Now, based on the fact that you are legally righteous before God, now there is no barrier for God's grace now to come into you and transform you and make you new. And this is called the imparted righteousness of God. All right. So once you, you are imputed with Christ's righteousness, the gift of righteousness to you also has a second part to it, which is Christ's imparted righteousness. He imparts his resurrection life into you. This life of Jesus that has already conquered sin, has already conquered Satan, that resurrection life of Christ now is in you the holy spirit comes inside you and now christ lives in you in your spirit and now the resurrection life of christ is is in you praise god and that righteous life now uh is is now working in in us and as we yield to that as we cooperate with that um, so that will produce good works and, and good fruit and everything else. And we, that, that causes a process called sanctification, where we are being changed from glory to glory, where we are becoming more like Christ. So there's a legal righteousness, which is the foundation of our relationship with God. 
but now within our fellowship with God, now that we are secure in Christ, standing on firm ground, uh, we now live by the righteous life of Christ, the resurrection life of Christ. And that's the experiential side. Okay, And so there are two issues going on in Galatians. First of all, how are you made right with God in the first place? That is called sanctification. And Paul is very strong that we are sanctified by faith in the grace of God, based on the cross of Christ, which has purchased our everything in our salvation. Um, and, and so we, we have that. But there is also the, the righteous life of Christ, which, which causes our sanctification, our spirituality, comes and Paul is saying in Galatians he's fighting a battle on two fronts because these two things are very closely connected he is saying we're justified by grace through faith alone but we're also sanctified by by grace through faith praise God and and so both our sanctification and our justification are by faith and by the supply of the Holy Spirit now, um, in the, the battle that's going on with the legalists, these legalists are attacking either one or both of these aspects. Um, the real hardcore legalists are saying, no, <laughs> yeah, faith is all very well, faith in Christ is all very well, but actually that's not enough. You must do the works of the law. You must be circumcised. You must do this, that, and the other. Uh, if you want to be right with God. The more subtle form of legalism, okay, and this is where Peter got caught out, is they would say, okay, very well, we are justified by faith in Christ. Um, that's fine. But now we're in the Christian life. Now we need to live by our works. We need to, we need to try and live this Christian life in our own strength. We need to keep the law. Um, and so the legalism comes in, not in the justification, but in the sanctification. And, and so now the Christian life becomes a keeping of, of rules, a performance on our part. And Paul says, no, that's wrong too. And he says they're so interconnected that actually by trying to be sanctify yourself by your own works, you are actually denying justification by faith too because they're, they're in connection now let's now go so the bottom line is this what Paul is saying is it's all by grace we can't save ourselves and we can't improve ourselves we can't perfect ourselves by our works God has to do it all I love the fact that God has taken on the burden of dealing with the guilt of our sin by taking it himself. God has taken the burden of undoing the negative effects of our sin. And God has taken on the burden of providing a life for us where, where we should live in a way that's pleasing to God. And all he asks of us is that we believe him. And we trust him and we just cooperate with him in that. But he is the source of that life. He does the heavy lifting. Praise God. And, and so in the, what we saw last time is that, first of all, uh, at the start of um, chapter 2, uh, he talked about the fact that he had this confrontation over the justification issue, that there were certain Jews insisting that, um, you know, uh, these Gentiles have to get circumcised and have to keep the law like good Jews if they are to be saved. And so Paul, first of all, says, no, I stood up against them. And the other apostles were in agreement with me that justification is by faith alone. That, that is the, the true gospel. But then there's a second story that we, that we heard about um, that started in verse 11 in chapter 2, where actually Peter falls into the trap of, of legalism. And... Um, and Paul has to stand against Peter. And it was on this more subtle issue. You see, Peter knew that the Jews and the Gentiles were justified by faith in Christ. They were equally 
you know, justified by faith in Christ because we're all equally sinners. But now uh, certain Jews came from James uh, in, in Jerusalem and they still had this idea that really these Gentiles were second-class Christians. You know, they had a kind of elitism that because they, as Jews, had accepted Christ, okay, they, they probably, because of the church council, had made up this decision, you know, that Jews and Gentiles are justified before God in Christ. But the Jews still kept the law of Moses. And, and still, in their mind, keeping the law of Moses gave them extra points before God. And these Gentiles were kind of inferior Christians. They weren't sanctified like they were. They were on a higher level. And so, as a kind of elite group, they started putting pressure on the other Jews there in Antioch. You shouldn't sit and eat with those Gentiles, because it's against the law of Moses. In other words, they, they were still very proud that they were keeping the law of Moses. And by holding on to the law for their sanctification, for their spiritual life, uh, it might not be the law of Moses, but a group of Christians might say, well, we keep these rules. And those other Christians who don't keep those rules, well, they're, they're, they're inferior. We must have nothing to do with them. They, they will corrupt us. They will defile us. And, and so, you know, basically, this is what was going on. And Peter, even Peter, stopped eating with those Gentiles because of that pressure, that, that social pressure. I think Peter knew it was wrong, but he just he didn't want he didn't want to fall out of favor with these these uh, these other Jews, and so he was by his actions he was contradicting the gospel, and that's why Paul was really upset. Because what he was really saying is, although God, you know, that somehow these, God hasn't done a proper job with these Gentiles. They're not fully acceptable. We can't sit and eat with them because they are still defiled somehow because they don't keep the law. And so it was actually a denial of justification by faith because he was really saying, you know, um, God hasn't done a, a proper job with them. They still, you, we still need the law of Moses and, and our obedience to the law of Moses in order to be fully sanctified and fully right with God. And so Paul saw the danger of this, if this carried on. And so he rebuked Peter. And uh, in his rebuke of Peter, he said, we are all sinners, you know, and we are all justified by faith in Christ and we are stand on equal ground, you know, how dare you bring this division in, you know. And so he, Paul was fighting for the gospel. But the gospel is in two parts. It's first of all that we are justified legally in right standing with God by faith, but the second part of the gospel is when you accept Christ, his righteous life, his resurrection life is given to you, and that is the life, and that is the power that will sanctify you and glorify you and bless you. And if you resort to the law uh, instead of the grace of God that is there for you, and you are trying and struggling to do it in your own strength, trying to keep these rules and laws, then you're actually denying the gospel. And that's what Paul pointed out to Peter. And we'll, we'll just read that quickly uh, but before we go into our, our main verses today. Um, I think we'll pick it up in, in verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that... He says, he, this is P Paul talking to Peter, correcting him. No, we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. Peter, you and me, we've, we put our trust in Jesus Christ. Um, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And, and he's saying, look, we're all justified by faith. We've all been made right with God. And if God has accepted these Gentiles because they believe in Jesus Christ, who are we to snub them and say they're not quite good enough for us? We're, they're, they're, they will defile us. That is a denial of the gospel. 
Verse 17, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, now we're into our, our main passage now, Peter, uh, Paul is still talking to Peter, and but now he's he's arguing the issue now. He's, he's made that big statement in verse 16, that we are justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, or any other kind of works for that matter. But now he's entering into the argument. And, and these next verses are quite tricky. Um, verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. Now what Paul is dealing with here, he is dealing with the main argument against justification by faith. The argument back is saying this. Look, if you make it that easy for people, if you say they don't need to keep the law anymore, they are just made right with God, just by believing in Jesus Christ, trusting in him and his salvation, and, and they don't have to do anything else, they just have to trust in Christ, and now they are not under that burden of the law, well, what's to stop them living a bad life? What's What's to stop them, you know, living badly you know this this is uh, the the charge of uh, you know that that you're just encouraging them in sin by by preaching this gospel of grace you're encouraging people to sin and then the ultimate accusation is he's saying you're making christ a minister of sin you're you're making the gospel of christ an encouragement to people to sin because hey i'll i'll just be forgiven and i'll just do what i want and, and that is the main attack by these legalists. He says, you can't throw away the law. He says, if you tell people you don't have to keep the law anymore, well, they'll, they'll just live bad lives. They'll live sinful lives. And it seems like uh, quite an effective attack. And uh, what he is, he is saying, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, which we do, because we know we could never save ourselves, our only hope is to be justified by Christ. We ourselves are found to be sinners. Now here he admits there is a possibility and that Christians will sin. Um, and you know, and some Christians may abuse the grace of Christ and 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 sin. And he says, but if we are found sinners, does that mean that that is because? of Christ? Is Christ the minister of sin? In other words, is the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ the reason why they sin? And he says, certainly not. Absolutely not. It's the opposite of our men. Absolutely not. And in the next verses, he'll explain why that is certainly not true. Okay. In other words, if Christians sin, it, it isn't because of the grace of God. It's because of their own hardness of heart and their unbelief, and their, 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 their sinful flesh, that they, that they do that. It isn't because of the wonderful grace of God in their salvation. That you can't put their sin to Christ's account. You know, it, it's their own fault, and they, they are responsible for their own sin. But the gospel of justification by faith does not encourage sin, and that will be made clear as we go on. And, and, and then he turns it around. Actually, in verse 18, he turns the argument back around. He says, but if I build up again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now, what I, I believe he's saying here is this. On the other hand, if I build up again what has been destroyed, what has been destroyed? in my salvation. What has been destroyed is the principle that I could save myself by my works, by my law keeping. In other words, what is destroyed is the role of the law in saving myself, the role of my works, the role of my flesh, myself in saving myself. I ha that had to be destroyed to receive salvation in the first place. I had to lose all that kind of self-confidence in my own performance that is destroyed but he says if i build that up again in other words i've having become a christian i now embrace the law again as my principle of life 
or whatever set of rules, and I turn from Christ to this set of rules as the focus of my life, and all I'm doing now is building up my pride, and I'm building up um, the law, and I'm, a I'm actually act activating the sin nature, because he says, I make myself a transgressor. And actually, he's saying that I am actually, if I do embrace the sin, uh, sorry, if I do embrace my own works and my own law keeping, if I embrace legalism, legalism had to be destroyed for me to come to Christ in the first place, but now I become a Christian, if I embrace legalism again and build it up again and make that the focus of my life, he is saying I actually cut myself off from Christ because I'm focused on myself again and my own performance. And he says, I make myself the transgressor. I'm actually sinning by embracing the law. So he turns the argument the other way around. He says, actually, when you embrace the law for your sanctification, for your perfection, for your spiritual life, and, and it all becomes about keeping the law, then you are actually sinning against God. Now, one example of this was Peter himself. He, he, he was very kind. He didn't say you, Peter. But that's exactly what Peter was doing. By embracing the Jewish law for the Christian life, he had sinned against those Gentile converts. He had made them feel unclean, unworthy, that the Jews wouldn't even sit with them to eat with them. He sinned against them. He created a partition in the body of Christ. He brought a division in the church. That Paul had to nip it in the bud because that was dangerous. And and. Peter was actually sinning by embracing the law. And uh, also, we sin when we embrace the law because we are actually embracing the principle of pride, that somehow I can do it. When the cro uh, It's a denial of the cross, because the verdict of the cross is, all our flesh is worth is crucifixion. All our good so-called good deeds are as filthy rags. And so I deny the cross, I deny the grace of God, uh, I, I, I'm basically saying I can do a better job than the grace of God. So I'm going to take my life into my own hands and I'm going to try and keep all these laws and, and impress everyone. And he is saying, I, by doing that, I make myself the transgressor. So first of all, he denies that embracing justification and sanctification by faith in the grace of God, that does not promote sin. He says it doesn't. But if Christians sin... It's it's on them. It's not on, on on the grace of God. Um, but secondly, he says actually, if you do embrace the law for your salvation or your sanctification, if your Christian perfection, you're actually become a transgressor, because you are rejecting Christ Himself. You are rejecting the grace of God. You are rejecting the cross of Christ, and you're embracing your own self performance. Uh, you're becoming self-centered in your own performance and you're just building up your pride. And and so he is, and then he goes on and he, and he gives verse 19. And he says, if I through the law died to the law, sorry, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. And now in verse 19 and 20, he is actually giving the positive reason why this gospel of grace does not encourage sin okay yes god freely forgives us yes god freely justifies us but that does not cause us to sin and he explains why here first of all he says i through the law died let's just think about that first of all i through the law died this is talking about the law was the instrument of my death now, what's he talking about here? Uh, in fact, in Galatians 3, just in the next chapter, let's go to Galatians 3, verse 10, first of all. You see, the law brings death. Because when we break the law, the verdict of the law says you deserve to die. All right, The law puts us under the penalty of death because we've broken God's law. Galatians 3.10, he says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 
So in other words, if you put yourself under the law, you are under a curse unless you fulfill it perfectly, which no one can do, you see. And, and so the curse of the law is death. And then if you go to uh, verse 13, Galatians 3 verse 13, it tells us that the penalty of the law is death, but the good news is that Christ has taken that penalty for us. He kept the law perfectly, actually, but when he died, he took the curse of the law that we deserved, which is death, he took that on himself. He took the death that we deserved. It says Christ, and in that, in so doing, he redeemed us from the curse of the law, the punishment of the law, which is death, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Praise God. And, and so notice, on the cross, he, he took our curse, the punishment of the law, which was death. And then notice in verse 14, he says that the blessing of God might come upon us through the Holy Spirit, through received through faith. The blessing of God is the life of God, which is released through the resurrection. So first the cross gives the, the, is the legal basis, and then the blessing, the life of God, is released through the resurrection. But you can only receive the resurrection life of God if you have come through the cross. If you've accepted God's verdict for your sin and Christ's provision for your for your righteousness through the cross. So anyway, going back to verse 19, he says, For I, through the law, died to the law. Now, what he's saying is this, that the law demanded my death. And... But, but Christ stepped in, and he'll make this clear in a minute. Christ stepped in because, well, let's just see verse 20. He, he, he makes it clear. I have been crucified with Christ. All right, so in other words, he is saying that the law demanded my death, and so the law took me to death, but Christ stepped in and died for me. But... I have been identified with his death. So in other words, although Christ was the one who died, he took the penalty of the law on himself. Because I am in Christ, I have been crucified with Christ, and as it were, I have died. Praise God. The law has, has, the law's penalty has been uh, affected on me because I have died. I have been crucified. Christ was the one who was crucified, of course, but through identification with Christ, I now, the penalty of death on me has been satisfied by Christ. Hallelujah. And that means the law no longer has any power over me, no more authority over me. I'm not under the law anymore, because if I was, it would surely condemn me. Now, we, we do need to see the cross-reference to this, which is Romans chapter chapter 6 chapter 7 sorry Romans chapter 7 verse 1 explains it in a bit more detail Romans 7 verse 1 do you not know brethren for I speak to those who know the law that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives all right so we, we are under the law all right for example but it only applies while while we're alive okay for instance if some if somebody uh, murdered someone and then he's executed, the moment he's died, all right, he's no longer under the jurisdiction of the law. All right, wherever he goes, he's not under the restriction of the, of the governmental law anymore because he's died. And now he use, they use the illustration of marriage. Verse 2, For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So she, she's under the, the, the requirements of, of marriage related to her husband, but only while he lives. The moment he dies, or she dies, they, you, they are free. She is free from that. Okay, verse 3. So then, if while the husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. In other words, she is not free to do that. She would be sinning to, to break that law of the husband. 
But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress even though she's married another man. Now here's the point, verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. So here we're in the place of this woman. All right. Now, we might expect that the law has died. No, the law hasn't died. The law is like the man. All right. We are the woman in the story. But the twist that Paul says is that now through the cross, through our crucifixion with Christ, we we have um, died. We You also have become dead. And through our death with Christ, that law no longer applies to us. We are no longer under the law, you see, because now we've died. Now we're free to marry another, he says, that you might be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. And so what he's saying is, while we're under the law, all the law would do was curse us. Uh, and Jesus, the law brought us to death, and we would have died under the penalty of the law eternally. But praise God, Jesus came in and took that death for us. But in union with Christ, we shared in his death. And now all the claims of the law over us have been satisfied in the death of Christ. So now we are free from the law to be married to Christ. In other words, we are now free from the demands of living under the law. We are now free to live for him, to be devoted to him. Because the law gets in the way, you see. The law activates our flesh and focuses us on all the rules and regulations once we're free from the law, now we are free to give ourselves to Christ, to be married to Christ and to bear fruit. Through our union with Christ, we can bear fruit for God. And so Paul is, is saying to Peter here, don't, if you go back to the law after you've been saved, you're being unfaithful to Christ. You're going back to your original husband. No, you died. That old you has died. You are, you are no longer under the jurisdiction of the law. You are under the grace of Christ. And Christ set you free from the law that you might live for him and depend on him and receive his grace and his life. And by the way, as you surrender to Christ, he will fulfill the law through you. It will become a natural thing. You don't have to concentrate on trying to do it. It will just happen as you live under the grace of Christ. And so he says, verse 19, Galatians 2, 19, For I, through the law, all right, died to the law, praise God, that I might live to God. So he is saying, actually, the way to live free from sin, the way to, is not to embrace the law. The law will just activate your flesh and your sin nature, and you'll just sin more. You know, if somebody just keeps telling you, don't have lust, don't have lust, don't have lust. Do you know, if anything, that's going to stir up lust? But when you turn to Christ, Christ's life in you will set you free from lust, you see. So it's not wrong to say th that, but if that becomes your focus, trying to keep these things, you will, you will actually end up depending on your own flesh, on your own strength, and you will just be led into sin. And so... Praise God, Jesus, through his death, has released us from the demands of law, of the law. We are no longer under the condemnation of the law. We are justified by faith in Christ. Hallelujah. So that I might live to God. Do you see that? So justification by faith does not encourage sin on the other. No, because it justification by faith comes out of our union with Christ, and in union with Christ, we become a new creation. We receive the resurrection life of God within. We're born again. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We have Christ within us. And if we will just live by the life of Christ within us, he will set us free from sin. We will be able to live to God. So we're set free from the law so that we can live to God. So Paul is saying, Peter, what, did, what are you thinking? That somehow by embracing the law again, that somehow you're going to make yourself a better Christian. He's saying, absolutely not. 
Um, you, it didn't work before you were saved. You couldn't save yourself that way. What makes you think you can improve yourself by, by means of, of your law-keeping? He says it doesn't make sense. But we, you should know already the flesh has nothing to contribute to your salvation. It's only God who can save you. It's only the grace of God that can save you. You see, and trusting in the grace of God. And he says, by going back under law, you, you're actually going backwards, Peter. Uh, it's inconsistent with the salvation of God. All right. And then he really makes it clear, and of course, verse 20 is the classic verse of uh, one of the most precious verses in the New Testament. For, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. And we already talked about that. Well, I've been crucified with Christ. In other words, the old me that was trusting in myself, that was trying to do it all myself by my own efforts, he says, that has, I, th I, that has been crucified. When I accepted Christ, I accepted God's verdict on that old me, that old independent me, trying to operate independently from God. God's verdict on that was crucifixion. The law's verdict on that was you, you deserve to die. And Christ provided that death and he did it, he took it for me. And so I've been crucified with Christ. Paul is saying I've embraced that truth now, that I can contribute nothing. All that I can do, all that self can do, is worthy of crucifixion. So I am not going to depend on myself anymore. But now I'm a new creation. Now I'm a new person. Now I live by a new principle. And the same principle by which I was saved, which is faith in the grace of God, is the principle by which I'm going to live. Faith in the grace of God. Notice what he says. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. All right. In other words, the, the big I is the ego. I, it's me living out from myself, my independent soul life. And, and Paul says, no, I've realized. And, and the law just feeds that. The law feeds the pride. Oh, look that I'm doing. Look what I'm doing. I'm doing all these great things. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And I'm, I am performing. And Paul has come to the end of that. He realizes that's, that's just good for crucifixion. I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, it is no longer I who live. Paul says, I've renounced that I life, <laughs> that self-centered, prideful, independent from God I. The independent soul life is my favorite title for it. Living out from myself. I'm my, my own source. I'm my own center. He says, it is no longer I who live. I don't live that way anymore. Because I've renounced the law as, 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 the, um, as the principle of my life. But, he says, here's the real key. Christ lives in me. Praise God. In other words, I now have the righteous life of Christ in me. Christ is in me. I'm a new creation. And the life of Christ is in me. The resurrection life of Christ is in me. Because I've accepted his death, and I've accepted his imputed righteousness through his death and his forgiveness, now I qualify to receive his resurrection life. And Christ has come into me. And now Christ lives in me. And Christ lives through me. And the principle of my life is now Christ-centered. He now animates my soul. And I live by the grace of God flowing from Christ. Christ lives in me. In other words, I don't have to try anymore. I don't have to strive anymore to get close to God. To get favor from God. No, because I don't have to do that because Christ is in me. He's already in me. Praise God. I don't have to try anymore. I just have to trust. We have to stop trying in our own strength and we have to start trusting in the grace of God, in Christ who lives in me. And one example is the difference between rowing and sailing, you see. Before, you know, we were rowing. It all, it's all our own effort. In the sea of life, we're, we're, tr we're trying to make it through in our own strength. And, and at, when we, as far as salvation is concerned, we realized, hey, all this rowing isn't going to get me to heaven. No way. 
<laughs> I needed to, to stop rowing and accept the grace of God. But now I'm in my Christian life. You know, it's more like sailing because you put up the, the sail, the wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing and he carries you along. He gives you the grace to live the life. If you will just put up the sail of faith and trust in the Holy Spirit, he will carry you, carry you along. You're not going by your own strength. Now, in, when you're sailing, you do have to do stuff, all right? But you are not providing the strength and the energy for your life. That energy is coming from the wind. It's, it's being powered. Now, you have to cooperate by loosening the sails or tightening the sails or, you know, a, applying the rudder or whatever. There are things you do, but those things don't generate lo the life and the grace. They just, it's just you cooperating with the wind in the best possible way. But the actual life source is, is from the wind. And so what a lot of Christians do is they get saved and they start sailing a bit, but soon enough they, put, they close down the sails and they start rowing. And they start thinking, I've got to do this all myself because the wind really isn't, isn't, I can't trust in the wind. The wind of God isn't enough. I've got to trust in myself. I've got to start rowing. And so we all get into legalism trying to do all the right things that Christians are meant to do, but it's coming from the wrong place. Don't get me wrong, we should do the things the Bible tells us we should do, but we're doing it in our own strength. We're, we're living under the law of legalism, and it's, it's ever so hard, hard work doing all this rowing. And, and in chapter 3, he says, you foolish Galatians, you stupid Galatians. You are rowing like mad, trying to keep the law, when all you have to do, and you already have experienced the, the Holy Spirit carrying you along by the grace of God, just by trusting in the wind. You can sail along, but you foolish Galatians, you've gone back to rowing, like in your old life. All right. You're acting as if Christ isn't in you. You're acting as if there isn't this powerful source of life within you that you can live out from that source of life but instead you've just returned to keeping all these rules and regulations and thinking that's how you're going to please god he says oh so you 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 stupid galatians we'll come to that in a minute all right so i've been crucified with christ it is no longer i who live but christ who lives in me and the life which i now live in the flesh yes we live our life in the flesh in this natural world he says, I live by faith in the Son of God. Praise God. In other words, I live by faith in the Son of God. In other words, he is saying, not only are we not, not justified by our works, we do not live by our works. Okay? He, he is saying, I live by faith in the Son of God. He's my power source. Do you, do you see that? So we're not. It's not just that we're not justified. We're justified by faith, but we're also we live by faith. We're sanctified by faith in the grace of God. We are. We do not live by our works. In fact, we we cease from our own works, our self-generated works, and we trust in Him to live His life through us. It's hard for us sometimes to surrender control and let him live through us. That's by faith, he says. He, he doesn't depend on himself and his own law keeping. But he says, I live by faith in the Son of God. Hallelujah. In other words, he's talking about his life now as a Christian is not legalism. It is not trusting in his works. It is living by faith in the Son of God who, is in, is, who lives inside him. And it's the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who lives in us, is the resurrected Christ. So Christ, the resurrected Christ, lives inside you, and he will empower you to live your life. And if you trust in him and his power, hey, you will find yourself loving God. You will find yourself loving people. You will find yourself doing good works and bearing good fruit. But you'll, you'll kind of say, well, hey, it's not really me. It's Christ in me. He's doing it. I can't claim the credit. He, it's like he's just carrying me along. It, it's, um, it's the most natural thing in the world. It's a joy doing what I do and serving God uh, in different ways. Praise God. And, and worshipping in church and all the things and praying and reading the word. of All these things become 
just natural and not stuff that we think we should get points for. All right. And notice he says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's love and grace. He loved me. That's his heart attitude towards me. And that love was manifested in grace. Love is manifested in grace. He gave himself for me. Now, again, what he's saying here is, um, in t how did he give himself f to me or for me? First of all, Christ gave himself for us on the cross. That's the manifestation of his love. He gave himself for us to die on the cross. But secondly, he gives himself to us now continually through his resurrection life. You see, once you've embraced the cross, that should put the end to all your I, yourself, all your self-belief that somehow you can do it. All right, that's been crucified with Christ. That kind of I, uh, independent from God, that's been crucified with Christ. Hallelujah. And then you can then you can enter into His resurrection life. Hallelujah. And uh, by living by faith in the resurrected Son of God who lives inside you, and He says, He loved me. This is the basis of His faith. That first of all, Christ loves me. And that love is manifested in two ways. He gave himself for me on the cross. But also the implication here is that he didn't just give himself for... If he gave himself for me on the cross, how will he not also give himself to me every moment of every day by his resurrection life flowing out? Christ who lives in me. And as his resurrection life is given to me continually, so he loved me. He gave himself f t for me on the cross, and he gives himself to me continually as my life source, so that I must live my life by faith in the Son of God, not by legalism. And when I do that, I will live a better life than the best legalistic performance trouble with legalism it becomes an imitation of, of a godly life it's outward only but it doesn't touch the heart and so legalists do the right things but they don't enjoy doing the right things it's they, they're acting against what they really want and, and often they'll burn out because they're doing it in their flesh and eventually they burn out but if you are living under the grace of god you won't burn out because you're doing what you want to do you, you rejoice in, in doing what you want to do. Uh, you're not struggling in your own strength. And, and so he says, he gave himself for me. So what he's saying is, I know because he loved me and gave himself for me, he is giving himself to me all the time so I can trust in him and he will always be enough for me. His grace is sufficient for me. So I don't have to resort to legalism. I don't have to resort to the law. See, when we resort to the law, what we're really saying to God is, God, I, I need to take control because I can do this better than you. I know better. I can do this better. I can live this Christian life better on my own if I just take control and just try and keep the law. You're basically saying, you're, you're, be, you're basically being a fool because you can't. He has all the righteous life that you need. He has all the righteousness you need. All you need to do is trust that he loves you, that he will supply all that you need for that righteous life, for that beautiful life that of grace. And you trust that his grace is enough for you and you live out from that. The reason why people hold on to, to keep to law keeping is that they, they're somehow afraid that the grace of God isn't enough. They've got to take control and 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 operate under the law and its foolishness all right verse 21 is his conclusion remember he's arguing against the, the people are arguing against justification by faith and they're saying oh it just leads you to sin or whatever uh, and they're saying no it's you know we need to be justified by our works as well we need to be sanctified by our works as well we've got to try hard to in this Christian life uh, to to please God and now Paul's final answer against that way of thinking is this in verse 21 
He says, I do not set aside the grace of God. A better translation perhaps would be, I do not nullify the grace of God. What he's saying is, the moment you take matters into your own hands and you try and live under legalism, you try and live by rules and regulations, you nullify the grace of God. Because rather than looking to the grace of God as your source, you're looking to yourself as the source of righteousness. And you actually are basically saying the grace of God is not necessary, it, it isn't sufficient, I, I, I need to depend on myself. It's unbelief. You nullify the grace of God. And actually, the more you try and do, do it yourself... You nullify the grace of God. You see, cause it to stop operating in your life because you're depending on all the things you're doing. And they might be very nice spiritual things, as it were, godly things, but in your heart you're trying to do it yourself. Whether it might be prayer techniques, but you're trying to operate them in your own strength. You're not operating them in the grace of God you see. And and so this, this cuts very deep. He says, the moment you are trusting in yourself and your own performance, you nullify the grace of God. God said, you know, if you're under anxiety and stress, uh, it's usually because we're trusting in ourselves. We're trying to do it ourselves, and we're just not designed to handle that burden. We're carrying the burden, and Jesus wants to carry the burden for you. And so he wants you to let go of trying to do it yourself and trust in the grace of God. Because if you try and do it yourself, you nullify the grace of God. The grace of God becomes passive in you. It can't operate because you're trying to do it yourself. You've taken over control. And the grace of God, as it were, switches off. And then he says, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. You don't just nullify the grace of God, you nullify the cross of Christ. Those are the two fundamentals of salvation, the cross of Christ and the grace of God. If you are saying that I can be righteous through the law, okay, then you're basically saying, what's the point of the cross? If I can save myself, if I can sanctify myself, if I can make myself a better person all on my own, just by keeping the law, just by doing my best, then what's the, what's the cross all about? I'm making the cross of no value. The whole point of the cross is I can't save myself. I can't, you know, keep keep these rules by myself. And therefore, because I'm, a, I'm fallen, I'm a sinner. And therefore, I can only be saved by the cross, by Jesus doing what he did on the cross and then providing his resurrection life for me. That's my only hope. But if I insist that I can become righteous by myself, whether becoming righteous in, in being justified or even becoming righteous in my Christian life, if I'm trying to do that myself by my rule-keeping, I'm basically saying... I'm denying the cross. I'm counting the cross as of no value, as superfluous. Because I'm, I can do it myself, thank you very much. I don't need the grace of God and I don't need the cross. And I end up denying the cross and the grace of God. You see, all the grace and the power of God for salvation comes from the cross. It's the merits of Christ on the cross that was released to, to us through the resurrection all of that's the grace of God. And if I don't put all my trust in the grace of God, flowing from the cross, I'm actually nullifying the grace of God and I am rejecting the cross. I'm saying the cross is, is not necessary because I can do it now. I can do it now. I can, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm enough. And that is, uh, Paul is pointing out, actually, by embracing the law after you're saved, is actually a, a great denial and a rejection of the cross and the grace of God. And so in chapter 3 then, he wraps this up by saying, no, rather than reject, putting, showing the cross as superfluous, because you're putting the I in the middle of your life again, and rather than the cross, he is now emphasizing the centrality of the cross for our salvation. And now 
he really uh, lays into the Galatians. Chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. Foolish Galatians. All right. And notice he normally calls them brethren or whatever. But no, it's not brethren. It's you foolish Galatians. And, and this is obviously strong language. And it basically means you should have known better. All right. You should have known better. You knew the gospel, but you didn't use your mind. You, you just heard these false teachers. They, they spinned it. They were very sincere. They talked about the law of Moses and, and how wonderful the law of Moses is. And uh, they spun a great tale. And they seemed very impressive. And you got bewitched by them. You got seduced by all, all of that. And you abandoned the grace of God. And he said, you were foolish. You didn't use your mind. You see, what he's saying is sometimes a salesman can just be very clever in the presentation and seduce you into accepting. He will work on your emotions. And they made the law of Moses very attractive and all of that, you see. and and But at the same time, when you're listening to a salesman, you must use your mind. You, you must use your mind. You say, do I really need this thing? Is this necessary for me? Is this actually good value for money? You need to not just be swayed by your emotions. And these Galatians, they got carried away. They got bewitched, he said, by this false teaching. It sounded so good. And and they claimed that they were from Jerusalem and they, they knew best. And he says, you're, you're foolish because you didn't use your mind. You forgot the gospel. And um, you should have known better, in other words. Who has bewitched you? And that's in the singular, actually. It's, it was, in fact, these, these legalistic teachers. But actually, behind them, as it becomes clear, it was Satan himself. You see, false teaching is it, called the doctrine of demons. So Satan works through false teaching. He says, who has bewitched you? And, and this is the word used for kind of hypnotized you, mesmerized you, 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 infatuated you with this other vision. And he says, who has bewitched you? And, and really behind it was the evil one. Because it's the evil one's favorite lie is to use religion to take you away from Christ, to, to, for legalism to take you away from Christ, that you replace Christ with a set of rules. And instead of trusting in Christ, you're trying to keep all these rules and you find your self-worth through keeping these rules rather than through your, the, the love of Christ, the, your, your acceptance with Christ. Notice he says, Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth of the gospel before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Notice what Paul is saying is, this is the, the heart of our faith that Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And, and this is the, the perfect work of Christ. We cannot save ourselves. Once you have a vision of Christ crucified, what do you see? You see your sin. You're, you see that, that Jesus was crucified for you. He took your sin. And then you have now nothing to offer. All that you have to offer from yourself is just worthy of crucifixion. And once you see that, you give up on your, your self-righteousness and, and attempt to, to perform, as it were. You, you, you give that up because you see Christ crucified. And not only in that, but when you see Christ crucified, it says the cross is the power of God. You see that Jesus has paid the price for all the grace and all the blessing and all the resurrection life that you will need. You don't have to depend on yourself anymore because he has done a perfect work to save you. And it says we are being sanctified um, through the offering of Jesus Christ once and for all, we are all being sanctified. In other words, Jesus did a perfect offering, and on the basis of his cross and his resurrection, we are being sanctified. That's the process. 
We can't add anything to it. It's all through the virtue of what Jesus did on the cross. And so as Christians, we must focus on Christ. We must see the cross and we, we see the grace of God flowing from the cross and we put all our trust in him, you see. And when we do that, we live under grace. We live under the power of God. And just by accident almost, as a bonus, we find ourselves doing the right things, pleasing God. And we have the love and the joy and the peace of God in the process because we're not trusting in ourselves. And then he wraps this up by appealing to their own experience. He asks them a few questions and he, and he reminds them, actually, if you think about your own experience, you know that you are saved by grace uh, through hearing the gospel and you live by grace not from the energy of your own works. This only I want to learn from you. All right, question one. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Remember, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And um, he's talking about their initial salvation. When they are initially... And, of course, the answer is it, was, it wasn't the works didn't come in. When they got saved in the beginning, it wasn't because they promised to keep the law of Moses or, or anything that they did to deserve their salvation. They just heard the good news about the cross and the grace of God and the free gift of God of salvation. They heard it. They believed it. And as a result, they received the Holy Spirit. They were born again. And the Spirit of God came in them. They were saved by faith. He says, you remember that. It's the law didn't contribute to your salvation at all. Okay, and then he asks um, the second question, verse 3, Are you so foolish? <laughs> Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? So now he reminds them of their early Christian life, because he was with them for, for the first few months. And, and they, they receive the Spirit, and they begin living the Christian life by the Spirit. You've begun in the Spirit. They, they experience the life of the Holy Spirit sanctifying them and filling them with his love, joy, and peace. And now he says, you foolish people, you stupid people, now you've decided that you can do it better. Thank you very much. I'm going to take control of my life and I'm going to live the, do the law and I'm going to keep all these rules and I can do a better job than what the Holy Spirit can produce in me. What kind of nonsense is that? Because all your own efforts just deserve crucifixion. So he says, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Now here he's talking about sanctification. It's not just justification by faith. We are sanctified by faith. You are sanctified, but you are made perfect by the Spirit, by trusting in the Spirit of God flowing in you. And he is saying, but now you've gone back through these false teachers to try and to make yourself perfect by the flesh. In other words, what the law does, it tells you, you should do this and you mustn't do this and do this. And that activates your flesh. That activates your own. Now you're living from yourself. You're not living from Christ. You're living from yourself, trying to do all these things. You're now in the flesh, trying to perfect yourself in the flesh. And he says, oh, foolish Galatians. All right. Then he says, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Verse 4. This has a double meaning here. This word suffered could also mean experienced. So one reading of it would have you experienced so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain so it could mean you know look you've experienced the grace of God in your life but now that would be all in vain if you go back to going in the law and so again he's talking about that or it could be you suffered in vain because because they accepted the gospel of grace they came under great persecution Satan tried to intimidate them to give up on the gospel. And they, they were persecuted. They suffered a lot. And now, for the gospel. And he says, now if you reject the gospel and you just go back into a kind of Judaism, legalistic salvation by works, all of your suffering is in vain. You're basically saying you suffered for a false message. And, um, and all that suffering was in vain. So he's appealing to their... 
their own experience there. But notice that little word at the end of that sentence, if indeed it was in vain. And so that shows that Paul had hope. And of course that's why he wrote to them, to turn them around, and I'm sure he succeeded. If indeed it was in vain. In other words, Paul holds out hope. It's not too late. If they will just get it and turn around uh, and, and repent of this legalism, then they won't have it have have been suffered or and uh, in vain and their christian life will not have been in vain because he ex he he does have this hope that they will repent at the, at that at his at his message and finally verse 5 therefore he who supplies the spirit to you now this is no doubt god God who supplies the Spirit to you. This is the word epikorigio, this word supply. It means bountiful supply, and it actually literally means epi on behalf of corigio, the chorus. And in those days, they would have these big theatre productions, and they would have these big choirs, and it needed a rich man to donate a big amount of money for for to keep a choir employed doing all these theatre productions. And so it was used originally for a donation on behalf of the choir. It meant a bountiful supply. And what it's saying is, this is talking about the, the present Christian life right now, we need to live out from Christ, out from the Spirit of God. Notice, God is continually, it's present tense, he's continually supplying the Spirit to us, abundantly. That's what it is. It, this word was also used in marriages where the husband was to uh, supply, you know, financially and in other ways, he was meant to care for his wife. He's meant to provide for his wife, you know, not just in a meager way, but you know, uh, in a, as much as he could, as it were, uh, to provide for her. And that's that word supply. So God, you know, in a sense, we're betrothed to Christ. God supplies the Spirit, not in drips and drabs. He supplies an abundant supply, a bountiful supply of the Holy Spirit to us for us to live the Christian life, for us to love God, to love, for us to obey God in the different way, areas. And, and he will supply the Spirit to us. And he continually supplies the Spirit to us. We just have to trust in that supply. His grace is sufficient for us. So he says, he who supplies the Spirit to us and works miracles among you. He says, well, the in the church, if we, if we will not look to our own law keeping and what we can do, but if we will look to Christ and what he can do, trust in him, he will work miracles among us. He says, you know, this is this is the mark. But when a church gets legalistic, there's no life and there's no miracles, you see, because everyone's looking to themselves and their own performance. But when we look to, to God, he supplies the Spirit and he works miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of the law? No. That doesn't happen when everyone's into their own law keeping because they're, they're looking to themselves. They're not looking to God. They're trying to build themselves up before God and others. But instead, he says, is it all by the hearing of faith? And of course, that's the answer. If we are, how, how can we experience the Spirit of God and the miracles of God in our life? It's by the hearing of faith. It's by, it's by opening our heart and listening to God and say, God, I'm trusting in you. I'm looking to you. I can't do it in my own strength. I'm hearing, I'm listening for your voice. You tell me what to do and, and I'll do it and I'll do it. You are the source of my life. I, it's living by the hearing of faith. Lord, you tell me what to do. And then when we do what he hear his voice and we do it, then miracles happen. The spirit is released, you see. And as, as we live by the life prompting us and leading us from within then we we experience the holy spirit flowing so it's through the hearing of faith yes hearing god's word but also hearing his specific guidance for our life it isn't by focusing on our own performance it is by looking to him for what he wants to do through us and just obeying that just yielding to that he says that's how miracles happen that's how the spirit gets poured out in our life and so he is, he is basically teaching them two things. First of all, the gospel is that you are justified by faith. 
in faith alone, in Christ. And through that, you, you're, you receive right standing before God, legal right standing before God. Righteousness is imputed to you, and that's on the basis of the cross. And once you are in right standing with God, now you have access to the resurrection life of Christ. In fact, the resurrection of Christ now is now in you. He comes in you because you're in Christ. And now you can live from that source, from that center, Christ in you. And if you do, you will live a truly good life, not just an impersonation of the Christian life, which is when you try and just keep all the rules, you're impersonating being a Christian. It's an imitation game. But when you live by the life of Christ within you, you experience the real thing. And so it's justification by faith, apart from the works of the law. Similarly, our Christian life, our Christian sanctification, our Christian perfection is also by faith. Pray in Christ. He is our life. And one of the subtle deceptions that comes in for Christians is, okay, we well, are saved by faith, but now you need to start keeping the law. Now you need to, to do all these things. And suddenly the focus is now on your performance. And if we're not careful, we, if it's presented in the wrong way, we, 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 we lose the vision of the cross. And he says, who has bewitched you? Let me just say this to finish. Who has bewitched you? Galatians 3.1. In other words, that's talking about witchcraft. Witchcraft is a manipulation of your emotions. To obscure the cross... All right, by taking your attention off the cross and the sufficiency of Christ, of what he's done for you on the cross, so that you rest in what he has done on the cross and you rest in the supply of the Spirit that flows from that. And you, the witchcraft dazzles you and draws your attention onto something else. The law, all these things, which have their own attraction. And... The problem is that brings you into self, self-focus. And you're looking at yourself and how you're doing uh, all these laws. And that's witchcraft. That, that witchcraft, through those false teachers, mesmerized them so they took their focus off the cross. So the key is get back on the cross. See Christ crucified for you. See that he has done it all for you. He's taken your sin and he's provided everything you need for life and godliness and it's freely available and he lives in you and he's supplying his grace to you. So stop trying and start trusting in the grace of God and live out from that. Praise God. And you are not living from yourself but you are living from the life of Christ within you. That's, that's what Paul is saying is the true gospel. Praise God. And so does the gospel of justification by faith encourage believers to sin? Absolutely not, because it connects them with Christ, the Christ who lives in them. And now, as they live by faith in Christ, they will live a superb life, much better than if they were just legalistic people trying to be moral, you see. So does the God true gospel encourage sin? No, it doesn't. In fact, it it causes you, if you start living by the same principle, you will live the life of Christ because Christ is in you. And so Paul is saying, no, uh, rejecting the law does not, uh, does not encourage sin because there is a greater source of holiness and life, Christ himself who lives inside me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God bless you. Amen.